I know you've been drugging me. I know you've been recording me. And now you're putting messages on my computer. Stefan, you're ill. We need to go and see Dr. Haynes and see if she can help. I know what you've been doing to me. I know. This is an excellent depiction of a concept called threat control override. Black Mirror is back, baby. It's weird AF, but I love it. And perhaps the episode with the most relevance to mental health is the film Bandersnatch. Now, I know if you watch it on Netflix, it's interactive, but I can't exactly do that on YouTube. So this is one version, but it leaves us questioning, is Stefan's paranoia justified or could he be psychotic? Ready? Let's crack on. I'm excited. Before we start, all time favorite Black Mirror episode in the comments, go. The correct answer is Hang the DJ, obviously. White Christmas was brilliant too. And Joan was not awful. Joan was amazing and we love Annie Murphy. La 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 la. Are you ready? Let's do it. I'm a Lamborghini. I'm a Hollywood star. I'm a little bit tipsy when I drive my car. Sorry, sorry, I was miles away. Got to get everything ready for today. This was some computer people. Yeah. Tucker Soft, they do Colin Rittman's games. Oh, not the Colin Rittman. He's on edge, isn't he? And this leaves us questioning whether there's an element of paranoia, though it could also be sensory hypersensitivity too. His focus on the ashtray is very interesting. One psychological theory about the development of paranoid delusions is called aberrant salience. We are constantly surrounded by lots of different stimuli in all of our senses. Our brain usually has a good way of filtering out what are the stimuli that we can ignore and where should we direct our attention. In aberrant salience, our attention goes to a stimulus that is pretty innocent and innocuous, something we would normally ignore. His attention has gone to the ashtray. Then it goes to, well, who put the ashtray there? When did they put it there? Did they want me to see it? What did he mean when he put the cigarette out in front of me? Why? Who's behind this? And you can start seeing how your mind runs away with you. And this is one theory that underpins how paranoid delusions can develop. Stay with him. He's made enough this year to buy a Lamborghini and he still smokes roll-ups. Yeah, well, pre-rolled has strychnine in him, so the joke's on him. Strychnine is found in pesticides, which causes very intense and uncontrollable muscle spasms to the point that in strychnine poisoning, people asphyxiate. I don't believe there's any evidence that strychnine has been found in pre-rolled cigarettes and roll-ups contain just as many carcinogens as factory made cigarettes. Don't be under the illusion that you're making the healthier choice with roll-ups. Don't copy this at home, never got around to reading it. You should. Jerome F. Davies was a genius. Didn't he go bonkers and cut his wife's head off? Well, yeah, but I mean, apart from that, excuse me. Yeah, apart from that, I mean, <laughs> That's going to capture most headlines and inform most of what's on this guy's Wikipedia page. So are we going to see uh, life imitating art in this? Relax. 1984 is interesting. Breakfast. Are you band of what? Band of snatch. So choose your own adventure book. Put me down from next door. Be the death of us. Is there an Orwellian theme of monitoring and control? I believe the term Bandersnatch is taken from Jabberwocky and Through the Looking Glass. So are we going to see this Lewis Carroll meets George Orwell meets Netflix eleganza? They're leading us down this road that the pills he's taking are for some sort of mental health condition, right? So what would they be in 1984? This is pre the development of the first SSRI, which was fluoxetine, otherwise known as Prozac. The paranoia makes me think it's an antipsychotic. This will be a typical or a first generation antipsychotic. So chlorpromazine, haloperidol, maybe stelazine. The proper name is trifluoperazine. Stuff that we don't tend to use anymore. The lad's a craftsman. He's a lone woodsman. I'm the same. Yeah, but it's... It's like I say, teams are fine for things like action titles, but when it's a concept piece, a bit of madness is what you need. And that works best when it's one mind. All right, Timothy Leary, we'll debate the doors of perception later. That was Huxley, not Leary. I suppose it depends on your definition of madness. And this does kind of revert back to the archaic and cliched stereotypes of the white male high achiever. 
where there's a fine line between genius and insanity. You said no. Well, not to the whole thing, just to working there, being under their control. I don't know where it came from, I just said no, and then I had to justify it by saying that I preferred to work alone. Whose control? I just don't know where the urge to say it came from. It sounds like you're growing in confidence. I think it's a good sign. This is an interactive film on Netflix, so the reality is that he is under the viewer's control. But for me, this could be an interesting depiction of the viewer taking on the role of the schizophrenic illness, distorting people's sense of reality and leaving them questioning what's real and what isn't. You sound like my dad. Oh. Sorry. He gets on my nerves sometimes. Get like this. I'm fine now. Transference reactions are common and to be expected in therapy. The patient transfers thoughts, feelings, the dynamics of a previous relationship onto a new one. The therapist then takes on the role of the overly critical parent, for example. So when they try and challenge somebody or maybe push back on what they say, they elicit some of those same emotional responses that the parent would have elicited. It's why the same dynamics in relationships can repeat again and again and again. It just feels like I'm being, I don't know, monitored. Perhaps you're feeling intruded upon because of the anniversary looming. You're being watched by loads it's of people on Netflix. It's a time of year for you. Can't underestimate that. This conviction that something is wrong, but perhaps a sense of vagueness about what it actually is, could be consistent with a psychotic symptom that's called a delusional mood. We see this in prodromal periods before full psychotic episodes then manifest. It's delusional because there is this fixed false belief that something is off, you can just feel it, but a huge amount of confusion about what is off and why. People then become very, very reclusive and we start to see this negatively impact people's function in lots of different areas of their life. This can then build up to someone's first episode of psychosis, which usually then manifests with a delusional perception. We see something that's real, but attach a false delusional meaning to that, that then makes us realize, oh, that's why everything has felt so off. That explains this sense of unease that I've been experiencing for ages. The guard comes down and then all the paranoid delusional beliefs start to grow in their intensity. That delusional perception helps explain that delusional mood, that vague sense of unease, and now this altered reality of paranoia makes much more sense and seems much more logical to you. I know he took Rabbit away and hid it somewhere. That morning, Mum was going to visit Grandad and Grandma. I was supposed to be going with her, but I couldn't find Rabbit anywhere. I refuse to go without him. Come on, Stefan, we're going to be late. Are you coming or not? So he blames himself and blames his dad for what's then gone on to happen to his mum because his dad hit the rabbit and then he couldn't find it. Psychological distress, including anniversaries of past trauma, might explain why an episode of mental illness is happening and manifesting now. Why not a month ago? Why not in six months' time? But that doesn't mean it's caused entirely by trauma. Indeed, the risk factors for psychotic illnesses are predominantly down to your genetics more so than your environment. Trauma is a risk factor and our approaches to support someone should be trauma informed, but that does not equal trauma being the sole singular cause. The past is immutable, Stefan. No matter how painful it is, we can't change things. We can't choose differently with hindsight. We all have to learn to accept that. Our past shapes our present and our future though. And I think wondering if things could have been different if we'd acted differently in the past is quite a normal human thing to go through. Did we have the free will to make a choice before that then means we are responsible for the consequences that have then happened? So we feel a sense of responsibility for those outcomes, which can be good or bad, depending on what those outcomes are. Which is very different to those people that believe in destiny, that our lives are mapped out by some higher power that then means that free will has got out the window, but also our responsibility for the consequences and the outcomes are... They, they don't sit with us, do they, right? It's not my fault, it was destiny. I don't think anybody really knows what the answer is, but I like to believe that the choices that I make day to day have consequences.
It's not going to end well, is it? Conspiracy books is someone that's possibly got prodromal psychosis. Paranoid project where we know something is off but not what it is makes us suggestible because we're constantly trying to find an explanation for why we feel this way and what is actually happening. We seek out explanations no matter how bizarre because the confirmation bias helps us rationalise it and then feel less paranoid and anxious because now there's an explanation. While this suggestibility doesn't necessarily determine if someone goes on to develop paranoid delusions or not, it can often influence the content of people's belief system. Why is one person's paranoid belief system around satanic cults whereas somebody else's is all related to the government? You said we were getting lunch. You need to speak to her. You're under pressure. You're not sleeping, you're not eating. I'm concerned about you, OK? I think the healthiest thing to do is to talk about any concerns you may have instead of bottling them up inside. Dad off of 1980s <laughs> might actually be right here. Talking is going to be better because it helps him be understood and it's going to help someone actually make a diagnosis if there is one that's there. Um, but Stefan's going to be wondering, well, how did he know? Is dad part of this conspiracy? He's taken him to the doctors without him knowing. This is only going to reinforce those feelings of being controlled by other people or other agencies. Like, I'm, I'm not in control of anything. Little things, tiny decisions, what I have for breakfast in the morning, what music I listen to, whether I shout at Dad or... You feel like you're not making these decisions? I feel like I'm not guiding them, like someone else is. Let's park the reality that if you're watching this on Netflix, the viewer is guiding all these decisions. This is a great depiction of something called passivity phenomena. Psychotic symptoms where there is a third party or external agency in control of different aspects of who you are. It includes thought alienation, so there's another agency that's either inserting thoughts into your head, taking them out, altering your thoughts or broadcasting your thoughts so that other people know what you're thinking. Other symptoms include a made affect. This external agency controls your mood, but people can also experience made actions, so they're doing things that are controlled by someone else, a bit like a puppet on a string, and made impulses. This only goes on to feed the paranoia, and our perception of our own free will goes out the window because I'm not in control of my thoughts, my feelings, my actions anymore. You're not hearing voices, or...? No voices, but there is something. I, I don't know, an impulse? I'm sure there is. OK, the fact that you're aware of your mental state is actually reassuring. To an extent, he's aware of what he's experiencing, but not necessarily aware of whether it's in keeping with reality or not. This is a very, very good depiction of prodromal psychosis. But it sounds like you're starting to dissociate, so we want to nip that in the bud before you start to seriously entertain delusions. I don't think we're there yet, though. This is prodromal psychosis transitioning into full psychosis, not dissociation, though dissociation can happen in people that are psychotic. But I would say the understanding of this concept of prodromal psychosis in the 1980s was primitive at best. Not everybody with prodromal psychosis will go on to develop a full overt episode of psychosis. Not everybody that has one episode of psychosis will go on to develop a chronic psychotic condition like schizophrenia. It's important to therefore keep a broad differential diagnosis. And in the UK, we have specialist services called early intervention services designed precisely to work with people like this to try and support people early, prevent prodromal periods going into full psychosis and to try and ensure that any diagnosis like schizophrenia is spotted as early as possible and the treatment is given as early as possible. I'm concerned about you, OK? You need to speak to her. I'm concerned about you, OK? You need to speak to her. So is he being watched? Or is this a visual representation of his paranoid delusional system? Much like when we watch Shutter Island, I think this is great because we as the viewer are left questioning the proportionality of his beliefs. What's real? What isn't? That's exactly what happens in psychosis. <laughs> uh, 
and non-adherence to antipsychotics is unfortunately common, particularly in the context in, and in the midst of a psychotic episode, because to you as the patient, this altered sense of reality is true reality. So there's no benefit to taking medication. They just make you feel sedated and sluggish. Or potentially, they're another thing that could be controlling you. Oh my God, the honey monster when you're psychotic must be terrifying. <laughs> Towards the end of his life, Davis was apparently self-administering hallucinogens on a daily basis. Hallucinogens have been given credit for creativity by some, you know, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, etc. People have tried to claim that Van Gogh's love of absinthe was another example, even though absinthe is not actually hallucinogenic. It just makes you absolutely trashed. It was the start of his complete mental collapse. Davis became convinced he had no control over his fate because his wife was spiking him with psychoactive drugs at the behest of a demon called Pax, a sort of lion figure. And he claimed he'd seen the vision and who ended up being incorporated into the book. Do not give psychedelics to people who might also be psychotic. There is some good evidence now that's emerging for the use of LSD, psilocybin, MDMA in conditions like depression, anxiety, PTSD and addictions. But there is also good evidence, particularly from its unethical use back in like the 50s and the 60s, of just how harmful these drugs can be if they're given to people whose primary diagnosis is a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Who's there? Who are you? Just give me a sign. Oh, come on, if there's someone there, just give me a sign. Will you give me a sign? I know there's someone there, just give me a sign. In someone with psychosis, this would be classed as a delusional perception, which is often the phenomenon that transitions prodromal psychosis into a full episode of psychosis. We see something that's real, it's really there, but we attach a false delusional meaning to that. And now this sense of unease and this absolute certainty that something is off, I just don't know what, starts to make more sense. Calm down, in through your nose, breathe, breathe in through the nose, Breathe in, So we're back to this Come idea on. of aberrant salience get with the away, ashtray, aren't we? So just get, stay away from me. I'm not in control. <laughs> Stefan, please. So please get away from me. He's trying to save him from himself. I mean, this could also be a delusional perception. I've seen the ashtray there, but I've attached a false delusional meaning to why it's there and what it signifies. If it is dad that's put it there, then dad must know about it. And then it inflames the paranoia and the fight and flight response that occurs physiologically as a result. And now if we combine it with his lack of any sense of agency, because he feels that his actions are being controlled by something else, that internal sense of any responsibility for doing something violent or damaging got out the window. There were legitimate studies into mind control using psychedelics, particularly LSD, but also other psychoactive drugs like barbiturates, one called amobarbital or sodium amytal. The most famous was by the CIA in the 1950s. There was one called Project Artichoke and then Project MK Ultra. These attempted to elicit confessions through psychedelic assisted interrogations, among other things. Not good. I know you've been drugging me. I know you've been recording me. And now you're putting messages on my computer. Stefan, you're ill. We need to go and see Dr. Haynes and see if she can help. I know what you've been doing to me. I know. This is an excellent depiction of a concept called threat control override. The belief that one is in danger, that's the threat, and that your thoughts, your behaviours, your feelings are being controlled by a mysterious, unseen external force, something that is beyond your control, 
So we've got the threat and the control. These then overestimate the likelihood that the threat will lead to you becoming harmed. And then a greater degree of impulsivity, a more prominent fight and flight response, including the use of violence to try and mitigate against that perceived threat. It's one theory that's tried to explain why there are higher rates of violence in people with active symptoms of psychosis compared to people without any mental illness. People with psychosis are much more likely to be at risk from others, but there are higher rates of violence in this group compared to the general population. It's such an interesting and again, a really good depiction, I think, of the stages of psychosis. That's my takeaway. I like to see the viewer controlling this episode as the illness and the consequences of this is a nice window into the mind to try and help the audience understand the experience of someone in their first episode of psychosis. You may have a different takeaway though from you. That's the beauty of these episodes. Let me know what you thought in the comments below and I will see you for another video very, very soon. Love you, bye.